Have you ever wondered when the collapse of the cannabis industry is going to happen? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Mark Batwell on Perfect Gardens TV. I just want to introduce you to one of our members, Austin. He ended up hitting me up and asked me just a wonderful question about economics. And I was like, you know what? Let's go ahead and jump on it because I thought a lot of great content could come from this. Austin, will you please jump on, introduce yourself, and then let's start asking some questions. If you haven't checked out our monthly membership, I highly recommend to do so. For only $2.99, you get access to over 1,570 photos, 162 videos, 10 files, 15 audio files, 562 shared links, and 86 members willing and ready to assist you through your growing practice. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Austin, starting up a home grow and have recently opened up an LLC, trying to make this into a business. So I'm trying to position myself in the best way possible as the market comes to light and we see kind of how this thing shakes down. You know, a bit, hey guys, I think Austin approaching this really is the best way to do it nowadays with this industry. Why, why is that, right? It's because you know, you get a skip from someone kicking down your doors to someone sending you a letter when they want you to pay for a bill, right? Like you, you go the legal route, it's a fine. You go the black route, it's it's guns and not keeping your shit at the end of the day if you get big enough. You go the legal route, you get the opportunity to shake hands, wear wear ties, and and be a gentleman in, in a sense. And and so your your first question is, I think, what was your first question? It was really, do you have enough time in this industry, right, to to make something happen? I want to position myself. I, I see myself making homegrown small batch craft cannabis attention to detail and the way it is you know it's really hard just to get all of the legalization and jumping through the hoops I mean it could take a million dollars just in paperwork to get all the forms needed let alone the infrastructure with the build out so I think what I'm trying to do is create something that's a home grow that's scalable that I could bring to different households if they want to produce their own cannabis then a way that you can get around the system because I feel like as this thing progresses Progresses, we're going to be in a crossroads between the home grow and big corporate money trying to get into the dispensaries because you know, like what you were saying about the black market, I think a lot of us have been suppressed in a way and um, by the same people that are now trying to jump up in the industry and get the money from us. And so I think what it's going to take is a very, why well, I say we're in a crossroads, it's going to take a educated consumer to say, hey, you know, he, he does have something cool going on in a hundred million dollar facility, but is the quality there or can I create higher quality myself and uh, creating a small localized group of, you know, farmers, uh, agriculture is I think the way that we fight this thing. So kind of just extracting what you're saying out of here, you're saying, how do you start a business and be competitive in the, com uh, as the commercial market emerges? 1000%. Yeah. 1000%. I, I think maybe i you know, I went off, but maybe I can try to reel it back in. But uh, in a new business owner starting off, I look at uh, some of the top guys, like maybe one, for instance, would be Planet 13. And I don't even know to date what their facility uh, cost, but I know it's a ton of money. I mean, it's probably within you know $25 million, $30 million facility. And so a small guy like me that's coming from a state that it's not California, it's not Oregon, it's not you know, we're kind of the underdogs. We're just now starting this race. And so how do I build something that either is a different niche to the market or just compete in the market? And this is kind of where I see the market going in itself, because unfortunately, uh, somebody like Planet 13, man, they got, man, that's awesome. Uh, they got a great facility. It's it's crazy. It's like a Disney World. But what happens when the tech industry comes into the cannabis and they got a billion dollars to play with? Or what if, you know, the alcohol companies start coming in and throwing money? So that model doesn't really work as we see federal can uh, federal legalization. You know, we're going to get squeezed out if we're trying to create these, you know, adventure parks or this kind of like corporized uh, kind of thing. I think what we need to do is stick to 
what made us or what made this culture is just like the tight knit group of individuals that are uh, doing this at a local level. Like you can go see, Hey, you know, even, even if I'm not growing, I can go see the local grow and say, Hey, you know, that's good quality. I know what he's doing attention to detail. And I think that's, what's going to get lost. And um, like I said, I think we're really in a crossroads to where the consumer is the one that's going to be the judge of where this market goes. It's either going to go corporate and, you know, it's going to turn to another cannibalized industry or we have a little bit of foothold in this industry and and, uh, take it back or keep it. There's kind of answered your question and you kind of came through your explanation kind of to the mine as well. The same thing I was going to say is how do you, how do you be competitive in a commercialized market? Well, by, and I hate to use the word marketing, but by marketing yourself, by being aware of a certain, a couple of statistics, right? 90% of the product grown in California is shipped outside of California, right? So if you are in a local area, anywhere outside of California product, it has to go through lots of, lots of situations and conditions to get to you. You know, there's there's a lot of marketing and explanation you could do to your local market to help not support the black market. You could say, you know, how many people have been arrested for the pound you purchased, you know, but before it got to you, right? Buy local, say, reduce the prison system. That's one, that's like one thing you could do. Like, I'm just, I'm just throwing stuff out there as, as you, you, I think you already hit it on the dot, right? It's like by keeping the, keeping the power out of the corporation's hands, it's by, it's by keeping the knowledge in the hands of the small individual corporation, uh, the local corporation, because either you're a sole proprietor or you're uh, you have an EIN and you start a corporation it, from S corporation C corporation LLC limited partnership, lots of different types of ways your entity can be structured by the government, but your best situation for free from taxation and also from liability is by starting a corporation. So in a sense, you are not the owner of a corporation, but you are simply a manager or a member of a corporation splitting yourself from the liability that can follow as long as you're not breaking criminal law, because those things break do break the corporate veil, which then the basically the 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 system will look at you as an, the same entity, the in, the corporation, and as the in, individual being one, which then your corporate veil once again gets pierced. So uh, explain to what you're saying though, like how do you stay competitive? Well, you know, the these commercial farms, they have to delegate out roles and responsibilities to other people that don't, and a lot of these people, they don't have the knowledge uh, to be growers. If they, if they, and a lot of these corporations feel like if they pay enough money, they are going to get a highly talented human being that c- will care as much as they do. More often than not, they're not. You know, they're not going to find someone that cares as much. As, no one will ever care about your business as much as the main owner of that business. More often than not, sometimes in rare occasions you find those people, but in those situations you try to make them partners or get or sweeten up the deal. So just knowing that type of information, right? There's there's always going to be a disconnection in a corporation, especially as it gets larger and larger from the knowledge and the, the knowledge, the integrity, the, the passion that goes around the, the business model. There's going to be a disconnection from the, the board of directors, the CEOs, to the people actually doing it. Each of them have, as you go farther and farther down, their appreciation and desire for the company to, uh, to dwindle less and less dependent upon the culture, how well the culture is intact in the company. So that, does that make sense? Oh, for sure. I think this is a little spinoff, but this is something that I want to say is that also, I think it's techniques because we look at big warehouse grow and it's predominantly hydro, like a home grower like me, I've really gravitated towards living soil. And when you look at it from a home grow perspective, man, it makes a lot of sense to do living soil. I don't get, I don't have to mix nutrients. I don't have to do all this crazy stuff, water three times a day. That's vice versa. Look at it from the corporate side and it's really hard to scale your living soil to make sure that if I'm testing one bed, now I'm going to have to test all the beds and making sure your amendments and everything are up to scale. So I think what we're going to see is a separation in how this plant's being cultivated as well. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you as on that. There's Because of this, the canning industry, it has really opened 
opened up Pandora's box around pesticides, fungicides, nutrients. People for the first time, I think almost ever, unless you actually were growing in a commercial situation or actually for yourself, I think the end consumers are actually starting to wonder. You know, they, I, th- I think that the questions around, pest, you know, the, the labeling is starting to uh, appear on food, you know, non-GMO, organic, natural, no, uh, you know, none of these types of chemicals. And there's a list of them in many products. So I think consumer awareness around what goes into their body and whether it, they actually want it to go into the body is also coming to the surface. So again, marketing those things, you know, if we could, uh, like you said, marketing the difference, growing with, chem- uh, growing with chemistry gr- versus growing with living soil. And then once again, trans, you have this knowledge in you as a small grower and you need to transfer it to your marketplace in the local level. So it's like, how do you do that and get to the end consumer before the corporation does? You know what I mean? Like the corporations are going to be branching out their marketing to a large sector. How do you get to those people that want your product or are or are interested in those in that type of commodity? How do you talk to them or get to them before they walk into those dispensaries? And I think that's also another important question. It's like, yeah. where are they hanging out? How public is your company? Like you said too, the the licensing around it. I think there's I think there's also a room to navigate this industry in still in that gray area where they where you're not going totally 100% to the corporate area. But there, I think there's this area probably in all states that allow you to grow X amount of plants, which if you're able to yield X amount of weight, you know, that will then start to slowly develop your company into the point where you're like, okay, I'm making enough money. I, I'm slowly reinvesting. I'm, I'm building, you're building up your brand in the area because it's actually a lot less expensive to build up a brand than it is to build up a company. If that makes sense. You know, yeah, so no, for sure. Build the focus- culture and then the culture starts creating everything. One thing that I wanted to hint on that it, it was a question before, and now it goes right along with what you're saying. It's hard to scale a home grow business because when you look at a, um, a state like Michigan, you could have, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure you could have up to 12 patients under the caretaker law. Mm -hmm. And then you look at a law like what the same law, but in Nevada, you can only grow for yourself. And so that would be also trying to navigate or trying to get a a hold on a definite plan count or definite number of caretakers that you can that you can get a part of would be huge to scale in a home grow operation. Knowing your local ordinances and laws is I think also another way, like you're saying, to navigate this industry still where it's at, staying legal, navigating your industry in your local ordinance while also developing your brand. Because if your home, if your home grow can yield three pounds of grow, you know, and you're and you're growing six plants up to four pounds uh, per six plants, you know, in the five by five square feet of space. And you can do that. And if you can harvest that only four times a year, just keeping it really simple. So that now becomes yeah. anywhere from 12 to 16 pounds a year. At the end of the day, most people, technically you could service probably 16 people a year, a hundred percent, right? And so that's another way, right? Giving in extreme customer service to only a few people to clean you out every time, right? Yep. So does that make sense? Oh no, for sure. Um, I can get into a little bit. I'm running a microgreens business as well. So I'm um, doing that as a startup, but I'm doing that as a subscription base, a monthly subscription doing free delivery. Mm -hmm. And that hopefully can transition right into the cannabis to where I can put them on a subscription base monthly, being able to drop it off delivery service. So I think that could be also something pretty cool. I I think that's also another great idea, right? Staying mobile, uh, staying mobile really makes it much more difficult for you to be tracked, you know, while things are still being figured out, while things are still in the gray. While you know local police officers are still uneducated around new ordinances being passed, you know versus being in a fixed position where any local ordinance or any local uh, permit person can walk in and be like swap uh, slap you for for not not having something perfect. So again, I've actually done all these things, believe it or not. You know, we had a company called Canna Freedom. Um, back in California, it was a delivery service that we operated for three and a half, four years. And it was, it got to a point where we were just like wanting to shuffle our own product in our local area, our own stuff. Uh, we realized like we could make the same amount of money shuffling our own product with our own little garden, having a, a mobile area, then dealing with the stress of growing a big old grow and trying to find buyers that could afford to buy it all. 
right? It was it was much more profitable doing exactly what you described and being being mobile and not trying to market to everyone which you create a target for yourself, but staying and keeping your marketing tight, local, making like, again, providing extreme customer service, le- learning how to preserve your product, right? So the, the stuff you grew and now all the way up to the last gram that was sold, you are, it's still profitable. You're able to give a, a better discount as it goes further older, but it, it goes, but people still want it because that's, that's what makes them feel good. For sure. That's, I've been trying to hunt the best genetics. I think the two things are environment genetics and that's another really exciting thing about uh, this industry is seeing the plant grow. I mean, within 10 or 20 years, you can see the evolution of the plant and just to see, just to be a part of it and to think about where it's going to be in the next 10 years. It's really cool. Did you want to talk about anything about when I think the collapse will happen in this industry? Yeah, I think that'd be awesome. You said around 2025. So About 2025 mm-hmm. is when I think this collapse will happen dramatically. You know, I... It, and the reason why I think this is because the three years I spend in the hemp side, you know, in one year, in one single year in, in Oregon, in Oregon and in mainly Oregon, we were able to lock up in just our main group of Mer- Baca, we were able to lock up about 10 million pounds of hemp, real hemp biomass that we went over there, physically got core samples of the product. And, and brought it out to our own testing facilities to verify whether the product was correct or not so that we could find qualified uh, biomass that was legal to sell it to the hemp market at that time in 2018, right? So, so in one year, and so that, and let me rephrase that, the hemp market was kind of blowing up, uh, starting to slow, slowly take off. I got in right when it shot up and right when it collapsed in one year, practically, uh, where, where the... Pr- the, the year before, the price of biomass was anywhere from $50 to $100 a pound. And then the following year was uh, between, it was also during a, a time period where people were really figuring out how do we charge for biomass, you know, and it came down to charging by uh, percentage of oil on the plant, you know, so if it had 10%, you were charging like $3, $3 a gram per, or $3 uh, per percentage point. Right. So it was like we, we, we had to figure out a way to, um, to create an evaluation on the, on the product so that we could sell it to our end consumer base, which was the extractors. Right. So they wanted, and they didn't want to buy the biomass, they wanted the oil on the biomass. So we had to figure out a price point of the oil that was actually uh, of the commodity that they wanted. And they wanted to figure out a price point for that. So, so, and then it would translate. So like a conversion table, it went from $3 per, uh, per percentage point. And then if there, if there was 10, uh, 10%, uh, 10% CBD on the, on the plant, it was $30 a pound. If that makes sense. Yeah. And that's how we figured out the, the price per pound. And then by the following year, the product was, uh, uh, we actually, uh, to be competitive in the marketplace, we needed to be able to sell product for 9 to $14 for biomass just the following year, right? So you can see the, how fast the market, the market collapsed when, when in only literally one year of legalizing hemp, uh, because it, the farm bill passed in 2018, if I remember straight, which le- uh, uh, created some definition of the of the of what's what is the legal percentage you're allowed to have and what's considered to be hemp what's considered to be can uh canna that happened in one year and, and 10 million pounds of product in just the oregon um small air, small patches of colorado uh 10 million pounds of pro- uh, product was produced in one year and so that's Right now, currently in California, a lot of people don't realize uh, anywhere, for, and I've heard estimates of anywhere from eight to 13 million pounds of, uh, of, of canna is being grown in California alone, right? And so we, because the legalization the rec, uh, uh, and regulations being defined and people begin to realize, oh, okay, you know, it's not as illegal as, um, I, I'm not gonna get as busted or it's a fine now, they are uh, they are are willing to take on uh, more risk, grow more plants where other otherwise before they weren't willing to. So when you begin to take into consideration the progression of where they are trying, where they're allowing uh, licensing and the progression of licensing and how many license holders can be can hold uh, 
you know, I, in California, it's, I can't remember the, what they're called, but there's, there's like four stages from a certain size canopy levels, right? And, and you take also into consideration that just two years ago, there was no cannabis being grown in Monterey County. And now when you literally walk outside my door, there's um, eight operations. You go out at night and there's massive beams of light from half acre to one acre greenhouse grows, all growing cannabis, uh, literally smelling up the entire Monterey County area. And then also you're talking about uh, Oklahoma, they're, they're allowing people to grow anywhere from three to 300 acres of, of canna. Um, and, and when you, and you, for the hemp side, they, we were producing anywhere from two to 4,000 pounds an acre, right? Uh, so when you take all those things into consideration and we're 80% of the canna market's oil right now and not flour, and it's going to biomass and extraction. And you think that we were just to be, uh, in 2018, it was 30, $30 a pound, um, you know, again, like $3 a percentage point, and it was profitable. Now it's $9, right? And there, and people are growing, people are, uh, people are talking one, $2 per percentage point for CBD. And these are, uh, these are sister plants, you know, just different oil. As you see the collapse of the industry and it going to oil, you can see very quickly that uh, even if you're producing uh, 30%, uh, 30% concentration on the plant, uh, you're going to see it go down to $3 a gram or $3 a percentage point. So roughly uh, to the wholesaler or to the, to the extractor, they'll be purchasing that pound at, at $90 a pound within, a, within I would say by uh, 2025, 2025 or maybe a year or two earlier. Now, is that just a baseline for your for this call out? Is that just a baseline, um, like, or do you think that there's is ninety a pound like uh, the the really good stuff is what I'm trying to say? Like top yeah, shelf that's a, that's like the top shelf stuff. People are really doing everything. They're getting thirty percent uh, oil on their plant, and you know when only twenty percent of the market is when twenty percent of the market where they're going to gobble that up. In my view, point of opinion. Uh, commercial market markets going to go to oil and local um, uh, boutique growers like yourself are going to gobble up probably anywhere from five to eight percent of the flower market and then the last 12 percent is going to go to the commercial as well so um, you know the in in and that and you're gonna have to be growing you know super like exotic strains right yep. those super super exotic the commercial market will if you got you always got to imagine the commercial market is going to absorb 80 percent of whatever you are doing so so if it's um if it's for flower market they're going to absorb what is that for 16 percent they're gonna they could absorb uh, absorb up to 16 percent of that 20 percent because that's 80 of the 20 percent of the 20 of that 20 to of that full 100 percent if that makes sense yeah. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So there, yeah. there, there are all, there's always going to be commercial growers doing really, really well at what they're doing, right? Um, and then the 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 people like yourself have to grow the really super exotic strains. Um, but the reality is, is that the commercial market uh, for oil extraction will drag down the entire market because they're going to be producing so much biomass. They're already doing it. I, I'll walk you over to a 70 acre farm in California that just got legalized with my buddy Pete Brown. They're putting up all the fencing for 70 acres. That 70 acres will end up producing, if they do well, it's going to produce 200 and what is that, 210,000 pounds per, per harvest. And they're in Santa Barbara. So that's at an area where they can, if they're doing it well, they can produce two or three harvests a year if they're really popping it off. So uh, they're, they're right there we're talking about one farm is going to be producing over 500,000 pounds a year. And again, we're talking about the, predominantly nine to 13 million pounds of biomass gr is grown in California and eight, 89% of it is shipped out. So right there, you have the one outdoor farm that has literally the best outdoor weather per year that's going to produce enough biomass for 80% of the California market be and and you know, so it's so yeah. that pl that facility will have to be producing their biomass and selling it to distributors 
for $250 a pound, 300. Even this year right now, my growers in Oklahoma are having to sell their biomass at $200 a pound and that came and their their product came in at 33%. They're, they're having and to during sell During Croptober? During Croptober, up 200, yep. And they, they only have, they only brought in 200 pounds. You know, a lot of people don't realize how small this industry actually is. Like a lot of people, believe it or not, actually don't really enjoy utilizing and taking advantage of this medicine. There's like, we are very small fish fish in a really, really large pond. You know, I mean, people don't like to feel, people do like to feel all over the place, but a lot, there's a more of them than there are of us. You know, like, like if you legalize this industry, for me, yeah, I might smoke a little bit more, but I'm not going to smoke it. I probably won't drink more. You know what I mean? Like, um, I won't, it's not going to change my lifestyle. You know what I mean? And so the, the people that have been wanting and de- desperate to get this product and use it on a daily basis, that was the black market. You know what I mean? They were, they're, they were consumers already and they might use a little bit more, but how many more new consumers are going to come on the marketplace? If that makes sense. The, does that make sense? Yeah, no, for sure. And this is why I'm encouraging people to take the techniques and while this market that like these small bit of growers out there, they're actually educating themselves on how to grow these plants better, how to maximize production, how to take a, a, a advantage of square footage in their growing space, how do you uh, take a, how do you learn electricity and construction and all these craftsman traits that uh, that our society has in a sense, forgotten over 40 years because we've been shipping out manufacturing from our country for, for 40 to 50 years. There's crafts and, and there's technique, there's things that we just have lost, you know, like the, 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 the access to knowledge has grown, but the, the desire to apply knowledge ourselves has dwindled, if that makes sense. Man, that's, that's, some deep stuff right there that's huge I so like that. that's where i pre- thank you brother and that's where i i pre i i uh i i i am encouraging these growers as they're developing their skills they really begin to educate themselves on maxing out um food production and then educating themselves on all the other possibilities that hemp can produce in other products. So it creates a, a stable product in your local uh, community. And I go back to hemp a lot. And I, t- I hope I'm not, a, I'm, I really do hope I'm not a pipe dreamer around this, but I do focus in a lot around biodiesel. I think, I think going to electric cars is the stupidest thing in the world. I think our grid system has, has, is over maxed out. I think we have a hundred year old, um, you know, electric system that's, that's one EMP from failing <laughs> completely. You know, I think uh, most of our dams are filling our back filling with sand. So a lot of people don't realize that, right. When they, when they build the, the dam, the, the sand and sediment washes down. Right. So it's, uh, within the, a lot of our dams that are produced only have anywhere from 70 to 120 year lifespan, you know, so that they, in a sense, have to go in there. And once they're filled up, there's, you know. Yeah, that's a ton of sand. I don't know what, how you're going to move that. How do you move that, right? They have to build <laughs> another dam down the, down the road. But they've been, you know, so I, again, I, I, I don't want to go into that, those areas too much. But my point is, is that, that we, we have to start thinking about how to produce products locally that are, local economy needs not not wants but needs they survive on right and then they they source locally if they're able to produce 30 to 100 barrels uh, 30 to 60 barrels of of uh, of of oil from from per acre from from hemp you know, the local communities need to start to work together. And I know this might sound like a pipe dream, but it is when you begin to think about, about the, what's happened in our society in the last three years, our, our, uh, the, the supply chains uh, shutting down, 
you know, everyone's starting to see it. You walk into our big box stores. Um, uh, I, I've heard from the grapevine that, that Walmart hasn't paid their bills in, in over a year on, uh, for, the, uh, for, for their produce. You know, so now you're having big box stores not pay their bills. We're having supply chain issues. We're having money, monetary issues. We're having um, our core society being ripped apart. Uh, the, the, at, at this point, I, I, again, I hope I'm not too much of a pipe dream around this. It's just the knowledge that you, the, the can of growers are accumulating, I think are going to be the humic layer in our local economy in the next five years as, as this plant doesn't like, what would you rather have? Would you rather eat or would you rather, you know, utilize this plant? Well, I hate to say it, eat, love the eat. plant. Love the plant, right? <laughs> like, like maybe, maybe you'll go uh, for a, a few hours without eating to enjoy the plant. But at some point, the plant's going to tell you, come back and eat. You know, that's what it does a lot of times, right? <laughs> so, you know, I think our priorities in our society are all flipped upside down right now. You know, I, I, you know what I mean by that? No, totally. One thing I want to touch on is, I mean, I'm big into living soil and regenerative gardening, and that just doesn't stop in the, the can of stuff. I want to do living soil, no-till, and market gardening as well. And a good, um, like an example of how we're destroying our society and it's within a mere, uh, you know, 50 years or so is look at the Midwest and they have no soil health whatsoever. And they keep tilling, they keep tilling, they keep tilling. And all they're doing is tilling away their nutrients. And I think um, our food is becoming less nutrient dense. And that's because of our practice. It's not because of the way it was designed. And this is a big, um, uh, light bulb goes off for me is like, man, this makes sense. This, this is healthier. This is a way better lifestyle. This is better for the planet. Um, so exactly what you're saying. I think that this is, uh, the, the skills used in can of farming can be used in your day-to-day -day life and it can actually change the, what's going on with all the supply chain. And that's, that's what I want to do. I want to create a business that is not only uh, can of business but it's a food business as well because i do think they go hand in hand and yeah. food is freedom you know and yeah, in that kind really of time are. they really are and they really are most most for most households they're spending a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars and thousand bucks to fifteen hundred dollars in food uh, a month you know your can of bill is what 200 you know it's like our priorities are all flipped upside down, man. Like we got to learn how to can, we got to learn how to preserve our, our food. We got to learn how to grow more. Um, we got to, we got to be reprioritize. Of course, I'm saying take advantage of, of the real estate, but I'm, but like, if you can only grow X amount of plants, don't, don't say, Oh, like, I, I guess I can only grow six plants. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get a job now at Walmart. No, like, Take your knowledge, put up some grow beds outside and, and lay down some new food, you know, and then when it comes in, value that as much as you're valuing your herb, you know, preserve it, learn to preserve it, learn to can it, learn to extract it, learn to, uh, to, uh, to cook meals. And that's why I go back to this other one is uh, the goal next year is to create a connection of how much food you, you need to grow in your, in your garden to produce a hundred meals, right. To the exact amount where you're like, okay, I need to produce X amount of tomatoes. I need to produce X amount of garlic, X amount of this, X amount of that. And if I do these, this amount and have this much square footage, I'm going to be able to produce hundred to 200 meals for my family that year. And that's kind of like the goal for next year. And this, I think this is where our, where we learn to reconnect. Um, I think this is just the, the, I think this is just where we're headed is, is reconnecting. I think when these big box stores and all this accumulative energy, like a big old rock, like a granite rock, like think about all of the minerals and stuff that are locked up in a massive granite rock, right? All, all these big box stores, I imagine these big old massive rocks and, and they need to get broken apart. And so it, all the nutrients that's, that's stuck in them gets re, re, redispersed back to its community. 
well, yeah, for sure. 1,000, yeah. I would love to see that. Did I answer your questions today? Yeah, no, that, man, it's been awesome. Uh, do you got any more for me on uh, this? Is, this is kind of like my only thought of why I think how fast this market will collapse when it, as it's continues its commercialized production direction. Yeah, I, no, I think, um, I think we're, I think that that can industry exactly what you're saying too. It might uh, speed up some things that are going on in today's economy and stuff. Um, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of fast money coming in there and it, it just the thing that I look about when I look at economics is trends and the quicker they are to jump up on the scene is as fast as they're going to fall off. And so that's something that's scary about the can industry is, you know, there is an unknown and it can fall apart just as quick as it gets started. And, you know, we haven't even seen the start yet. So um, it, for, for sure, I think we're onto something here. All right, brother. I'm going to let you go. I appreciate the time today and having this conversation. I, I hope, uh, I think something good. Yeah, came man. yeah for sure. I'm um, starting up again, so uh, I'll keep you updated, but just been uh, popping some, some seeds. So just getting everything going again. Um, also, I saw your videos and um, been talking about seeds a little bit and seed breeders. And mm -hmm. I have a little bit of info just, if you wanted to put down the cheat or if it that goes to the wayside, but I've been using Turpy Seed Bank. They've been one of the uh, bigger ones. Uh, their shipping's really good. It is one guy, but um, so like customer service on this stuff. I mean, you could email him, email him, email him. He, he's probably not going to get back to you, but um, I uh, try to go for some of the bigger, like what I see is like the more hype stuff. Um, so in-house genetics I've been running. Uh, and then also some of THC Titan, he has two different brands. One's called square one genetics and one's called Robin hood seeds. And like yesterday, I tried to get some beans and it, the whole, he collapsed the website. Like there was so many people, so much traffic on the website that it just collapsed. So, um, Dude. that was the second time that it's happened back to back days. So th there's some, uh, good genetics from, from those guys. Also thug pug is another one too to take are a you, look at you're on the, you're on the telegram aren't you yeah okay yeah. The you know i i when the when next I, I i don't know if you ever get a chance do you see the threads on for the sunday or saturday calls yeah i don't know if i see them too late uh, is it is it saturday and sunday no okay so, so i try to go live on sundays twice uh, twice uh twice on sundays and then i go live on a totally on a totally private call for you guys two Saturdays. So I uh, normally I tried to post it there like a day or two before the link and and get okay. it. So um I will do a better job of creating an actual real schedule so everyone knows the dates. Okay, yeah. Cool. Long term. Yeah, I definitely want to want to hop up on those. I've watched them on YouTube, so might as well hop up in there. Yeah, cool. Really I appreciate cool. You, I appreciate you. I want the, the I I definitely want to save those conversations for for that time. You know. Yeah. Yeah, because no, you're, think... you're sharing bombs that I definitely want to share with the community at that during that time, because it's, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think all we have is, is each other, you know, and mm -hmm. this is a strong bond from all the things that, uh, that we've experienced for, for, for trying to do what we love to do. So uh, the, what we have is, is each other. We got to stick together and that's how we fight this thing. And, and this is how we prevail and come out on top. So for sure. I appreciate you, Austin. Um, hey, thank you. Thank you. Hit me up if you ever need anything. And uh, I'm going to check out this video, see how it turned out. Awesome. Thanks. All right, brother. See you there. Bye. We build their awareness of how long it actually takes for water to break surface tension and absorb into the water. And I was talking to Dave a little bit about it this morning and he started rattling off all kinds of things. And I was like, you know what, Dave, why don't you jump on the call with me today and, <laughs> and share your insight around this too. So please jump in and tell me what you were, what we were talking about a little earlier.